I kept uh, I kept holding off hitting the the go live button. I kept saying to myself, "Do you want to do this? You want to do this post game show? Do you want to hit the go live button? It's it's a Saturday night. It's almost like seven o'clock. You can just go chill. You just go watch um what is this Ohio State Wisconsin that's coming on here in a little bit. Still got channel eleven on the TV, um and I assume the game is on." That channel is, I, I don't i don't know if it's not, but Channel 11 is great because it comes in over the antenna, so I don't have to stream it, so I don't have to be way behind. I was like, I, you don't have to do this post-game show. You don't have to sit down and talk about this game. You don't have to do any of it. You don't have to relive it. You don't have to even sit here with your legal pad. You can just throw your legal pad across the room. You don't have to do any of it. That was my actual legal pad with all the notes on the game. I wonder if I might need that during this post-game show, but you know what the reality is? I don't think I will. I don't think I will need that legal pad on this post-game show. I don't think I'll need to look at notes on this post-game show. I don't think I'll need to reference game notes or stats or history or personnel or playing time. I don't think I'll need to reference what happened in this game from the minute it kicked off until the minute it ended. I don't, I'm, I mean, I obviously will. We'll talk about the game. But I don't think I need my notes from this game. I don't even know if I'll need to click over to the box score from this game. Because sometimes there are games that are just so bad. So discouraging. It's so disappointing. You know, I got a text from somebody, good friend of mine, close, you know, big Pitt fan, close follower of Pitt. Uh, I got a text from a friend. Um, Let's see how long ago it was. Uh, about 20 minutes ago, I got a text from a friend and, uh, I, uh, he, he said, what do you even say? And this is a smart guy. You know what I mean? Who, who always has something to say, always has really informed, important, uh, good takes on things, valuable input. I like talking to him about some of these things and we, you know, it's, he's a smart guy. I like bouncing things off of him. Um, but he says, what do you even say? And I think that's a great question. Because I don't even know what you say at this point. And as I sat down before I started this thing, as I was questioning whether I should even do it, whether we should even, you know, bother with this hour of pit talk after, uh, you know, after you know, this game and the way it went, as I was thinking about it, I, I was thinking to myself, I was like, what, what do you even say? Like, what, what's even the point to have this post-game conversation? I mean, obviously a big part of the point is to let you guys vent. I mean, you probably have people around you that you can complain to. I'm sure you have pit fan friends that you can text. You're certainly on the message boards, which are a dumpster fire right now. And will remain that way until this, you know, post-game show ends. And I've had a few shots and a few beers and I go in and delete a bunch of your posts uh, but for now, I mean, you, you've got that as an opportunity to vent and, and sort of kvetch and, and spit out all of your anger. But that's also what this live stream is going to give you an opportunity to do. And, and the comment section is always already filling up um, comments and questions. If you have comments, you have questions, you know, put them in the, the chat screen. If you want to make sure we read your comment, and read your question, uh, you can be a... Uh, uh, you could be a super chatter. You click the little dollar sign at the bottom. We'll make sure we get to your comment or your question and, and read it. And then, and then otherwise, we'll read as many as we can um, uh, of the various comments and questions that are out there. And so that's why we do this live stream. But I, I, I was thinking about it, and I was just like, you know, what, what are we even going to say at this point? But then I went back and looked. All right? And I went back and looked at 2020 because 2020 is actually when we started doing these live post game shows i don't know if it was because of covid and i was just home all the time so i figure you know i can't go to the game although i think we we did cover those games in person i think yeah um so i don't know what what it was due to but it was like hey let's do live post game shows and so we started that year like mid-season i think the first one we did was maybe boston college or louisville or something like that and i did one after the notre dame game that year it was the 45 to three loss or whatever it ended up being. And, and and it was interesting because that was the first live post game show we did that went over an hour. All the other ones were like 35 or 40 minutes. And that one, we went over an hour for the first time. And it's all been over an hour since then. I mean, there might be something like 58 minutes or something like that. But after that loss, 
one of the worst of the Narduzzi era, arguably the worst of the Narduzzi era, maybe even worse than the 51-6 to game, we found lots to talk about. And so I think we'll have a lot to talk about here. And I was thinking of that Notre Dame game for a few reasons. And I think at this point, we'll get the shot glass out. Because I was thinking about that Notre Dame game in 2020. That Notre Dame game has come up multiple times this year. We talked about it. We brought it up here on the live post game shows. We brought it up on the Wednesday night show with Jim Hammett, and probably a few times during the uh, during during the week on the morning pit episodes that we do here on on YouTube.com/slash/Panther.com. We brought up uh, that Notre Dame game in 2020. We brought it up. Because it usually comes up in the context of asking, when was the rock bottom point of pit football under Pat Narduzzi? What was the lowest of lows? And that's the, the, the point that I always look at. That's that's the game and the week and the, the stretch that I always look at and say, that was it, man. That was the rock bottom lowest point possible. Let's do a shot. Because this, right now, this might be worse. You go on the road and you get beat by 51 points. You go on the road and look like you're going to be competitive until you just have a litany of errors and mistakes and screw-ups and just lack of logical thinking and reasonable thinking in all three phases. You blow this game and lose by 51 points in all three phases of the game. You get treated by another FBS team the way an FCS team gets treated by an FBS team. You have their backup quarterback in there still throwing touchdowns against you. You are to the point. You are losing so bad that you are putting in your own backups. In game eight of the regular season, you are putting in your own backups in a blowout loss. You look like you don't belong, never mind the same field, you look like you don't belong in the same division as the team you are playing against. A team that is ostensibly in the same field of 65 as you are. And you look like you don't belong. And earlier this week, and I, I was trying to find the quote before I started, but I couldn't really dig it up. Pat Narduzzi said something like, well, you know, I wonder if it would just be better to get blown out than to, to lose at the very end the way they did at Wake Forest. Well, now you can make a comparison. Now, now you can put the two together and say, boy, which one was worse? Because last week was an embarrassment with the way you lost to Wake Forest by making mistake after mistake after mistake. Never mind the fact that your offense went into a hole for 10 possessions and only got one field goal out of those 10 possessions because your offense is terrible and cost you the game just like it has cost you multiple games this season. And then you fast forward to this week and you still have the terrible offense and you still can't defend and you blow it on special teams multiple times. You get one good punt out of Caleb Junko, maybe the best punt he's had all season, and you get multiple guys with their hands on it. The punt returner doesn't zig or zag. It's not a great blocking scheme or anything like that. You just miss tackles, just like you miss tackles all year on defense and you miss them on special teams. You give up another touchdown because MJ Devonshire decides to field a ball at like the seven or something or the five, which I always thought if you're inside the 10, you don't try to field it. But apparently that message doesn't get communicated from the coaches. That's not part of Pitt's special team scheme. Apparently in Pitt's run, punt return or special team schemes, you are supposed to field the ball there. But he tries to field it, drops it. It goes in for a touchdown. Multiple interceptions. Multiple missed tackles, multiple over pursuit of the run. And Audric estimate, I mean, yeah, he's good. He's big, but did I miss the point where he became Jerome Bettis? What are we doing here? Yeah, I said I wasn't going to look at the box score. I said I wasn't going to bring up the, the box score or anything like that. Let's, let's do it. Let's look at the box score just for a second. Because Notre Dame had 535 yards of offense. 535 yards of offense. Notre Dame ran 65 plays and only faced eight third downs. And after Sam Hartman got some of those jitters out on the first three drives with the two interceptions and the turnover and downs, he went touchdown, punt, field goal, touchdown, punt, touchdown, 
And then I think the other guy was in for the other touchdowns. It's bad offense. It's not good enough defense at, at a certain point. And, 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 you know, we could go down the, the road of talking about Pitt's defense and kind of what's going on there. And, you know, they played great in the first quarter. I, they played really well in the first quarter. I, I tweeted this out. It, it, it reminded me of the second half against Louisville where they went out and they gave up yards and they gave up drives, but they made a lot of big plays. It, it, t- tonight, they had two interceptions in the red zone, you know, and then forced the turnover on downs. I mean, this is great, you know, great job, you know. Gave up yards, but you, you, you held them out. I mean, still down 7 nothing because you give up a punt return because you can't make a tackle. You have two guys with their hands on them. You can't make a tackle. But then at a certain point, and I'm not saying this happened tonight. I'm, I'm not going to say the Pitt's defense like quit or something like that. But if I was on Pitt's defense, I would get pretty tired of going out there after you know misfire after misfire after misfire on offense. Pitt goes three and uh, here's Pitt's offensive drives three and out three and out punt after five plays interception miss field goal interception punt after five plays interception interception you did three interceptions in three plays and then three and out four and out and then the Nate Yarnell drives and, and there's like so many like little things, and, and this is always the case. Uh, you know, I, there were little things that I made notes of, and I'm and I don't have them because I threw my notes over there. Um, but there were so many things that that I made notes of. I'm like, mm, that's interesting. We'll have to discuss that. How they they rotated in uh, left guard, and at the end they brought in Jason Collier, or you know, or uh, the linebacker assignments. What they were doing, and Jordan Bass, and Braylon Lovelace, and they, you know, at, at one point early on in the game, they, you know, during what could have been a crucial situation, they brought out their defense had two freshman linebackers, and you know, this and that, and they they played this guy or they played that guy. Why were they doing this? Why were they doing that? And I could talk about like, no, they didn't target Gavin Bartholomew. What was up with the running back rotation? But when you lose a game 58 to 7, it feels kind of stupid to haggle over those little details. And we can haggle over those little details. And I'm sure we will because we have a whole hour, right? How far into it are we now? Uh, I don't even know what time we started. So I won't even know. Oh, we're only like 10 minutes in. So yeah, we got a lot of time to go over some of those little details and we will. But it feels really, really pointless right now to haggle over those details when you are getting your brains beat in 58 to 7. When you give up 500 plus yards of offense, you know, what did I say the number was? 535. You gain. You gain 255 yards of offense. How, how, is the, how is that even possible? I don't care if Notre Dame has the 85 Bears. This is college football. And Notre Dame doesn't have the 85 Bears. This is college football and you put up 255 yards of offense. How much do we need to see out of this offense Two hundred fifty-five yards of offense, barely squeak out a touchdown, convert one third down in this game. Pitt converted one third down in this game. <laughs> Five turnovers. They forced a few, forced two, two interceptions in the first two drives. None after that. Didn't get into the red zone once. Uh, I'm just looking over the box score here. Notre Dame was scored six times on seven red zone trips. Pitt did not reach the red zone one time. Because the Nate Arnell touchdown was a 25-yard pass, right? To Kanate Mumfield. Or, uh, yeah, 25-yard pass to Kanate Mumfield. I hope you guys have I hope you have drinks. I hope you have something to drink because we're gonna need it during this show. I'm gonna go to the chat. I wanna know what you guys are thinking about and uh talking about and we'll um we'll go from there. Listen, if you want to make sure you're look, there's lots of comments and questions out here. You guys have a lot um to say and I appreciate that. Uh I definitely want to uh get as much <laughs> I want to get as much of your comments as uh and questions as I can. Uh, so if you want to be a super chatter, you should do that. Click the little dollar sign at the bottom, kick a couple bucks to the podcast, and we will definitely get to your comment or your question. Michael B starts us off as always. And sir, we salute you. We'll have a quick drink to you. Says Chris, this loss is an absolute embarrassment and a scathing indictment on the head coach and coaching staff as a whole. The team literally quit. Pit football is now a bottom feeder. Narduzzi needs to be held accountable. 
All right. Well, a couple thoughts there. I, I I'm not gonna say the team quit. Um, I I don't like saying that. I, I mean, I, I I believe that these kids go out and fight. I, I think they try hard. Somebody else mentioned Nate Yarnell throwing a block on the one the long longish Sebo Flemister run there near the end. I mean, Carter Johnson didn't quit. Kanate Mumfield didn't quit. You watch. I, I saw one of the snaps, the Yarnell snaps, maybe on the final drive and like. Yeah, you know, I mean Gavin Bartholomew, poor Gavin Bartholomew looks engaged. I mean, like, I don't believe they they quit. I mean, you know, one of the later, later defensive drives, they're pulling guys apart because they're they're pushing each other. I, I don't want to say they quit. I, I don't like saying that. And and I think these guys still played hard. I think they still tried hard. I think they gave it everything they had. Um, you know, obviously this state, this team in its current state and current incarnation, uh what do you want to say personnel or coaching and probably some combination thereof uh, is, is, is not good enough, or at least. So you go back and forth. All right. I, I think there are good players on this team. I think there are playmakers on this team. I think there are guys who can make plays. Um, I do think tonight's outcome was impacted fairly significantly by the offensive line. Uh, and, and, not to be too harsh on those guys, but you have a lot of guys thrust into some challenging situations. Ryan Bear is moving over to left tackle because Branson Taylor doesn't make this trip for some reason. I'm sure Pat Narduzzi had nothing to say about it uh, after the game. Tarantino steps in to make his first career start. And like, yeah, Tarantino gets, I think, two false start penalties, gave up a few pressures, but he was making his first start in like, the most hallowed grounds of college football in America. I mean, that's a challenging spot to be in, a challenging position to be in. And Notre Dame wasn't laying back. They were being aggressive. They were getting after it and, and bringing a lot of blitzes and putting a lot of pressure on Enos and B.J. Williams, a true freshman, and Terrence Moore, who's a first-year starter, and Jake Cradle playing over at left guard. Who knows what's going on there? Ryan Bear as a first-year starter playing at left tackle instead of where he's been the last few games at right tackle. They were in a tough spot. Yeah, I mean it was it was a challenging situation for those offensive linemen, and I think that it 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 blew up on them, you know. Um, it, it it was it was sort of a it's the word I'm looking for. It, 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 it everything sort of came together to create the worst possible scenario, you had the worst possible combination of, of 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 events and elements, and they have lead, you know ended up resulting in the worst possible outcome and and then you know and to make matters worse you give up two touchdowns on special teams I mean, you give up two touchdowns on special teams one on a punt return and one on a, on a fumbled punt so i mean that's 14 points right there that you're staking notre dame that isn't even a result of your offense or your defense you know i i mean one one is you get a, a stop on defense you force a punt and and you muff that and then the other you can't cover the punt so i mean that's what you still give up 44 points <laughs> defensively. Uh, you still only scored seven offensively, and that was with your you know your backups against Notre Dame's backups. Um, I don't think there's I, I, like I know I went on a rant there where I talked about how they looked like they didn't belong, and I mean you know for today they didn't belong. I think they're better than that. I think the players are better than that, but they've obviously got to figure some things out about who they are as a team, what they want for the leadership of this team. Um, and, and what direction they want to go with this team. And, and I think that means Pat Narduzzi. Pat Narduzzi, I mean, he's not going to do anything today. He's not going to do anything tomorrow. But when this season ends, when that Duke game ends, he's got to make a lot of decisions. A lot of decisions. And, you know, made a big deal about how there was no coaching staff turnover this past offseason. Well, he's probably going to have to find some, some changes there. Now, I don't think you go through a year like this with some very obvious and glaring deficiencies, particularly on one side of the ball, and not make changes. Um, and and I think that has to be inevitable. You know, I, you you can't you can't run it back next year with the same coaching staff. You know, you can try and rebuild some of the roster and and try to you know build forward with some of the roster and some of the guys who are getting a lot of playing time this year, but. And, and I, I, I'm not going to sit here and call for guys to lose their jobs, but you can't run it back with the same staff. You just can't. What else did Michael B. say? Um, Pitt football is now a bottom feeder. I mean, they had, they had a terrible game. 
You know, I mean, they had a really bad game. Uh, I, I don't think it makes them a bottom feeder in college football. It makes them, you know, having a bad game and having a bad season. Clearly a bad season. I don't think they're a bottom feeder in college football. They finished ranked the last two years. I don't think that goes away because of one bad season. I don't think what has happened in multiple other seasons erases or, or is erased because of one bad season. But what it does is it creates pressure for you to take a step forward next year and, and rebound from what is a very bad season. I, I think if there's, I mean, I can't even call this an upside, but I think if there's one thing to look at, it's that this year's team had very clear and obvious problems, right? Very clear and very obvious problems uh, that may not be deeply rooted, by which I mean, I think may be easy to sort of correct or, or make a change to and uh, try to do better next time. And, you know, chief among those is going through the first five games with Phil Dracovic as a quarterback. No no personal disrespect to him, but he he didn't play well. He wasn't good enough, and, and he probably shouldn't have been the starting quarterback for this team from the beginning. You know, we, we should have eight games of Christian Bayer at this point. Uh, you know, whether, you know, and, and I've been told by people who know that Dracovic was clearly the best option coming out of spring camp, clearly the best option coming out of training camp. And so I don't know what that says about Christian Bayer. But very clearly, Dracovic should not have started five games. I, you know, I've said a bunch of times, I, I think he probably should have been sat down at halftime of the West Virginia game. Um, but he wasn't. And, you know, Pitt lost multiple games because of it. So that's one major issue, you know, and if you had five, six, seven, eight games of Christian Bear as your starter, then you could proceed into another conversation about Vare versus Yarnell, which is probably a conversation that's going to have to happen if Vare goes out against Florida State next week and throws four interceptions again. Because if he does, well, quite frankly, the coaching staff will have waited too long to make a change. Once Vare gets to like two interceptions next week, maybe three, you need to make a change. Ideally, he wouldn't throw any. If he starts throwing them, I don't think you can stay with him. You, 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 you know, you can't worry about ruining his confidence for the future. Or maybe you can. Maybe, like, actually, maybe you can. Because at this point, do, do, do wins even matter? You know, if, if you really think Bayer is going to be your guy for the future or you want to find that out, then you let him in there and you let him play, even if he throws two, three, four interceptions. But he was not good tonight. He was good for one drive. And that drive didn't even result in points. I think that was the drive, was the drive I think, with the, uh, the missed field goal at the end. So he was good for one drive and the rest was a mess. And and it wasn't easy out there. I mean, the, the, the pass blocking, the pass protection made life very difficult for Christian Bear, and, and understandably so. Those guys, you know, new starters on the offensive line, young players missing four starters from the offensive line, four guys who were expected to start. Mack and Salves, nope. Ryan Jacoby, nope. Um, Blake Zabovic, nope. Uh, and Branson Taylor, nope. I mean, you have the sixth different starting offensive line combination in eight games. That That's a tough spot. It didn't have to be this bad, though. But like I say, it was sort of a combination of things, and it created the worst possible scenario. All right, let's uh, scroll down here. RJC Man 38 says, Nate should have started the second half. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, th I think there's something to be said for how long you stick with Christian Bayer in, this in a game like this. I mean, Pitt's down 17 to nothing at halftime. Uh, Vare, you know, what did he have in the first half? Did he have two interceptions or three? Let me see. Uh, two interceptions. He was 9 of 18 for 83 yards and two interceptions. Yeah, I mean, I guess if I was going to bench Phil Dracovic after the first half at West Virginia, I probably would bench Christian Vare after the first half in this game today. And then you see what Vare, what Yarnell can do for the second half. Um I, I can't argue with you about that. I can't argue with you. I mean, maybe he should have. Maybe he should have come out to start the second half. Maybe he should have come out for more than two possessions. Um, see, Max Harris says, any chance Signetti gets fired before the end of the season? I can't see any reason to keep him on staff after watching this garbage offense. 
Uh, well, Max, first of all, thanks for being a super chatter for the first time. We appreciate it. Your, uh, you know, your, your contributions to the podcast are greatly appreciated. I don't see Pat Narduzzi making any kind of staffing changes in the middle of a season. It's something he's never done, and, and I just don't see him doing it. I think, I yeah, I just don't see it. I mean, I don't have any, like, great elaboration on it. No, I, I don't see that happening. I think at the, end of the season, at the end of the season, he obviously needs to take a long, um, a long, hard look, an evaluation at the offense and the progress of the offense. I mean, look, this is a guy who was ready to fire Mark Whipple after the 2020 season. This is a guy who looked at Mark Whipple after two years and, and was ready to move on, if not for Kenny Pickett coming back, which Pickett wouldn't have done if Whipple had been fired. You know, I, I often think back on this because people will talk about, I can't believe uh, Narduzzi wanted to get rid of Whipple, you know, blah, blah, blah. I mean, Pitt's offense was terrible in 2019, and they weren't that great in 2020. Kenny Pickett, I, I think, grew and developed over the course of the 2020 season, but obviously it was hampered by an injury from the Boston College game. But if you recall, after the Notre Dame game, which was, at least up until now, rock bottom of the Narduzzi era at Pitt, the lowest of low, um, you know, after that Notre Dame game, they had an off week, and Narduzzi really kind of took the offensive staff to task and, and said, you know, as we've heard it told, and I think Narduzzi has since told this story himself, really kind of sat down and said, look, I want every piece of data and info you can come up with. I want to know our tendencies. I want to know what's working. I want to know what's not. I want to know why we're doing the things we're doing. And I, I want to know why we're not doing some of the things we're not doing. I want everything you've got. And to my knowledge, that's the most Pat Narduzzi has ever done with the offense uh, over the course of his eight years. That, that's the, the most he's ever sort of dug in to the offense. That's not to say that he's completely ignored the, the unit. I, I, I don't think he ignores it as much as he sometimes makes it out to be, uh, although he definitely doesn't make it a priority to focus on the offense. Um, but that time, you know, post-Notre Dame 2020, is, is the most he has really invested in the offense. And whether their subsequent improvement is due to that or just due to changing the schedule or getting Kenny Pickett back, whatever it was, the offense did get better. Narduzzi needs to take that level of interest now for the rest of the season and in the offseason. He needs to know and be told and be shown exactly why what has happened so far happened. He needs to find out what the source of all of this is. Um and then he needs to make some conclusions and maybe make some some tough decisions. Uh, let's see who. Uh, Jay Bish is a super chatter. Says, I know financially it's not going to happen, but Narduzzi is done for. His team has quit. He refuses to adapt, and he lost the locker room. Time for Narduzzi to go. Uh, I Like... That's a question of whether you think bad seasons happen sometimes this is um my thing that i've always said and i, I think i wrote about this in the 321 column on friday i talked about it a bunch of times here i've talked about it on the live stream like the live show the weekly live show that we do i've, I've written I, i've talked about it a lot over the last few years and and it's just sort of different conclusions i've come to after covering pit football for you know 18 years now right I, for the vast majority of programs in FBS, for the vast majority of teams uh, that, that play Division One college football, uh, if you look at the entirety of the sport, right, there's there's a top tier. And that top tier is anywhere from 10 to 15 teams. Probably not much more than that and quite possibly less. It might be only about a dozen teams. There's that top tier. And there's a very, very bottom tier of teams that are down at the bottom. And it's not, no, that's not... A uh, pit, Michael B. You know, you called them bottom feeders either earlier. That's not pit. Pit is in the great middle, uh, and most teams in college football, a clear majority, are in the great middle. And in that great middle, what you're attempting to do is establish something of a floor for the program on an annual basis, uh, while understanding that you you're going to go through cycles due to personnel turnover. Uh, you are going to go through cycles. And, and some of your cycles are going to be influenced by when you lose seniors or when you have guys grow into their roles and they start for a couple years. And then, you know, you, you'll cycle up when those guys grow into roles sort of together and, and you have this, this perfect storm of 
seniors at a lot of key positions with a lot of experience and, and you can really take a big step forward and capitalize on that moment when you when you have an opportunity to cycle up like Pitt did in 2021 but you're going to have cycle down um and and it's going to come because guys like that are going to graduate and move on uh it's going to come because you're going to have some key injuries and because you're in that great middle you you don't necessarily have the depth to absorb a lot of those kind of key injuries like maybe some teams in the top tier have Uh, Because you just haven't recruited well enough to have that kind of quality depth. And again, this is not unique to Pitt. This is the great middle of college football, right? And so you'll have have cycle up where it all sort of comes together. And then you'll have cycle down. And, And usually right after you have cycle up, you'll have that cycle down, which I think is what we've seen, you know, last year to some extent, but, but this year. Uh, you're having that great sort of cycle down. Now, the key is, and, and what the really good programs in that great middle are able to do is to minimize the the number of times that you cycle down or or spread out, you know what I mean, make those, those waves bigger so that you cycle down less often. Uh, and then also to make sure that when you cycle down, you don't fully bottom out. You know, you don't hit the bottom. That you, you know, you're able to, oh, c- cycling down is maybe six and six, ideally seven and five or eight and four like you that that's your cycle down you you can hold on to it but sometimes you cycle down and you do hit bottom you do bottom out like Pitt is doing this year but that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to stay there I don't think anybody thought after 2021 that Pitt was going to stay in the realm of 10 11 wins every year you know I I think even like last year I I probably predicted nine and three for the regular season or maybe eight and four this year i predicted like eight and four or uh, i don't think i went as low as seven and five but i predicted eight and four thinking seven and five or lower was a possibility probably not lower than seven and five i didn't think they would really bottom out like that i thought the bottom of pit cycle this year will be seven and five you know that could be eight and four with good luck six and six with bad luck and instead it's been bad luck bad coaching bad play and they're truly bottoming out at two and six and so, what was even the question that, that got us off on, <laughs> on this tangent? Oh, Jay Bish says, uh, Narduzzi's team has quit. He refuses to adapt, and he lost the locker room time for him to go. Well, it's not because I think he's built Pitt into um, this comfortable spot in the great middle where they have, they've had that cycle up, right? And, and they've shown that they can get there which I think leads you to believe that they can get there again. And that's a tough sell when they're coming off a 58 to seven loss. And I don't fault anyone for feeling like a change should be made in the aftermath of a game like that. Uh, super chatter, Steven Richmond, good fan. Uh, appreciate you. Uh, Friend of the podcast says, Pit bad, beer good. Yarnell throwing a block down by 50 was hilarious. I don't know, man. I might start going to Harmerville to watch intramural indoor roller hockey on Saturdays. Well, I mean, to be honest, Steven, you only have three more Saturdays left, right? Because the Boston College game is on a Thursday night. So they're two and six. There's four games left. That's all they're going to play. They've got three Saturdays left. I, I think you can, you know, You'll still, at at some point over the next four weeks, you'll get to go to Harmerville and watch the indoor uh, intramural hockey on one of those Saturdays. You watch football the other three, and then you have, you know, all of December to enjoy yourself. But we appreciate you as a uh, super chatter. Steven didn't really have much to say. So let's uh, do a shot in Steven's honor. Steven Richmond, the man so nice they named a city after him. I don't really know you, Steven, but I, I uh, appreciate you being a super chatter to make your joke about intramural hockey. At least we can all get together and talk about it, right? Somebody said this should be a a three-shot show. I don't think we're going to do that because at some point when this is done, I'm probably going to try and like write something (laughs) for pantheller.com or maybe wade into the message boards start deleting posts. I usually, I'll tell you what I do on the message boards. I give people a chance to um, <clears throat> vent. Usually about, you know, Pat Narduzzi says he's got the 24-hour rule. I usually give people about 24 hours 
to kind of vent uh, within reason. We try to keep it a little bit reasonable, um, <clears throat> you know, and, and not let uh, not not get too out of control. But I do tend to let people spout off for about 24 hours. And then Sunday afternoon, Monday morning, we start cleaning things up a little bit and, and getting it under control. But I'm, the message boards, they're wiling out right now. They're wiling out. Uh, William Huber is a super chatter. William, uh, it's your first time. Thank you, William. We appreciate you. We'll toast you, William. If you don't be like William, click the little dollar sign down at the bottom. You can uh, throw a couple bucks to the podcast, and uh, we will definitely read your comment or your question. There's a lot of comments in here, a lot of questions in here, um, <clears throat> and we will. Uh, I'll get to as many as we can. I see our friend Reed Koberger in here. Reed, good to see you, buddy. Uh, hope all is well with you. It says uh, Chris's post game podcast are the most fun thing about pit football this whole season. I appreciate you, Reed. Uh, good to hear from you. Hope you're doing well, man. Um, but William Huber is a, a super chatter for the first time, so we appreciate that. We're definitely going to read his comedy. He says Chris, this team has poor coaching and little talent. This is the result of the quote diamond in the rough and mid tier three star recruiting and whiffing on quarterback. Okay, a couple of things there, William. All right, quarterback we can talk about in a second, but I, I can't hear it about diamond in the rough and three-star recruiting when Pitt, i think led the acc in draft picks over the last three years that's not uh, you know you know when Pitt is and and their recruiting has largely been the same for the last eight years and over the last three years they, they i think they lead the acc in nfl draft picks you know since narduzzi arrived they're second in the acc in conference wins it that's that's not it that's not it. They're in a rough spot this year. They're, they're definitely in a rough spot this year. There's no question about it. The offensive line injuries have wreaked havoc more than they did last year, more than they did the year before. They have wreaked havoc on this team and caused a lot of problems. Not all of the problems. Good protection wasn't going to make Phil Dracovic any better than he was. You know, Phil Dracovic really struggled this year um, and, 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 and wasn't good enough, okay? But the offensive line has been a, a major problem and largely due to the injuries it's taken four starters out right and on defense i mean we talked about this since the beginning that this was going to be a young defense that this was going to be a unit that, that was replacing a lot of starters a lot of key guys particularly right up the gut kalijah Kansi is an all-american Savasier dennis is a draft pick at linebacker eric howitt and brandon hill are draft picks at linebacker and those guys are all gone and then all those veteran defensive ends productive or not all gone Deslin alexander john morgan habba baldonado all gone, and you're replacing them with new players. And even if those guys that left weren't the most productive defensive ends, and they weren't, you're st they still had experience, right? And that's what you were lacking when you turned to Dayon Hayes, Bam Brima, Nate Temple, Sam Lola, and, and beyond them, Jimmy Scott and, and Nikai Johnson, a defensive end. It was always there was always going to be a period of, of adjustment and transition. And, and that's what we've seen. And, and the thing is, and, and people say, well, it's game eight. They should be much better. I mean, sure, I, I buy that. They should be much better. Um, but at the same time, improvement and progression, I mean, it doesn't always just, they're not always just steps forward, right? You can have young players that get on the field for the first time, guys that get out there and they're playing and 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 they'll look great a few plays and then they'll take a step, step back. They'll make a mistake. They'll over-pursue. They won't do their assignment. They won't trust their teammate. They won't just stick in their roles. And so many times, it just comes down to that. Knowing your role. Reading your keys and, and following your role. Notre Dame threw a 60-yard pass off a of play action. And every one of Pitt's linebackers chased the running back. They chased the running back this way. The receiver went that way. And guess what? There was nobody out there. And they got a 60-yard play out of it. Now, those were some of the veteran linebackers. So that's not great, but there are a lot of guys who are in starting jobs for the first time, right? Guys who are getting significant playing time in the base defense and in the third down defense for the first time. And, and you're going to have ups and downs with that. That, that. that comes with it. But I think there's still talented players in there. They need some guys to step up at defensive end, and they're probably going to need to go to the portal to get a good pass rusher. Um, you know, somebody to help out. Just uh, seeing tweets, and I'm curious. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, former Pitt players are 
tweeting about Pitt, and that's distracting at times. Let's stay focused on, on what we're talking about. Those three-star recruits, and it's not always diamond in the rough. You know, I think sometimes it's guys who are underrated, but their offer sheets look better than they would for that, uh, you know, um, you know, for, for, for the level of player that they are. But, I mean, I think the recruiting that they've done, like, don't forget any of the success they've had over the last few years. Winning the ACC championship, winning 20 games over two years, finishing both years ranked, all the draft picks that they've had, the ACC wins that they've had, have all come from largely the same level of recruiting. It's not just a, a recent revelation that they recruit at a certain level. They've been recruiting at that level for eight years, for nine years, and it's led to a lot of success. But this year, they've got a perfect storm of a lot of different factors that are leading to one of the worst pit seasons in, I mean, more than 20 years. Uh, what else, uh, William? Did you have something else in there? Um, and whiffing on a quarterback. Okay, so the quarterback thing is a, a problem. You know, I, I don't think there's any question about it. And look, Mark Whipple didn't really recruit quarterbacks very well. Uh, he didn't hardly recruit quarterbacks at all, right? He brought in Nate Yarnell, and he brought in Joey Yellen. And it was really it. Um, you know, he brought in Joey Yellen as a transfer. That obviously didn't work out. He brought in Nate Yarnell. We'll see. You know, I think Yarnell, between the Western Michigan game last year and the, uh, you know, two passes today, I'd like to see more of him. <laughs> you know, uh, I'm not saying I've completely given up on Christian Bayer, but you got four games left. Let's find out what, what you got on the roster. Another super chatter came in. Uh, see where he is. Focus Pooler 1 says, Is it my imagination or is tackling getting worse? Uh, is it my imagination or is tackling getting worse? It, it's not It's not making the steps forward that it needs to make. I mean, I'll, I'll say that. It's not making the steps forward that it needs to make. Um you know, I said that like improvement, it's not always, you know, step forward, step forward, step forward, that there are sometimes steps back, but something like tackling, that should not be the case. That should be consistent steps forward. Assignments, responsibilities, knowing your job, know, knowing what to do and, and where to go and, and trusting your assignments. Those things can be step forward and step backward because it happens in the heat of the moment. Uh, and, and, you're a young player, you're an experience, you're on the field, you can get overwhelmed by things. And I understand that. You can lose your sense of what you're supposed to be doing or where you're supposed to be doing it. Or when or what the other guys are supposed to be doing and, and how you fit into the you know one of 11 and all that stuff. But tackling, man, you've been tackling ever since you started playing football. And 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 I'll like I'll be honest with you. All right, let's 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 just be completely honest here. How far are we? You know, we're 40 almost 45 minutes into this podcast. I'll be honest with you, okay? Aside from the play at quarterback, I think, and, and you could even tie this as well, I think coaching's been the biggest issue for this team this season. I do. Um, I don't think, I mean, I just, I don't I don't need to elaborate on that, okay? I, I think it's been the biggest issue. Uh, I think there have been a lot of correctable mistakes that have been made uh, by the guys on the sidelines and up in the booth. Tackling is not one of them. Tackling is entirely on the players. Tackling is something that you've got to be able to do. If you're going to play defense, the college level, the FBS level, okay? And I'll direct a lot of a lot of comments and a lot of criticism on the coaches. But the players have to be able to tackle. And, and that's not a product of the coaches not coaching it. They coach tackling. They, they work on tackling all the time. They work on tackling during the season. They work on tackling all through training camp and all through spring camp. There's no excuse for missing the first two tackles. And, and, and no disrespect, because I, I think these two guys are really good at their jobs, but Byron Floyd and Javon McIntyre, that punt return should not have been a touchdown. You both laid hands on that kid. Ta there's no excuse for being as bad at tackling as this team has been at times this season. And I, and I don't know if I would say the tackling is getting worse. I just don't think it, it, it doesn't seem like it's any better. They have moments where they seem like they're better, but by and large, it doesn't seem to be getting any better. And 
yeah, Audric Estime, yeah, that, that's a tough challenge. He's a tough guy to tackle, but come on, man. Have some self-respect. Tackling is not a coaching issue. We can talk, and we do. We spend most of our time talking about the coaching issues. Tackling is not one of them. I don't think. I don't think it's 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 that that's on the players. So we'll put that on those guys. Um see if we have more super chatters in here. Scrolling through. Well, I can start going through the comments and uh, questions from uh, the non-super chatters. If you got, if you want to make sure you get a comment or a question in, um, you can uh, you can do that by being a super chatter. I'm going to start running through some of you guys uh, who post started posting questions right from the very start. I just want to check something real quick because one of the first questions is about Phil Dracovic. Um. David Stern, or David Steen, excuse me, not the NBA commissioner, says, uh, just out of curiosity, why don't they show Phil Dracovic on TV? Haven't shown him once since he was benched. I I'm not sure. I mean, he's still with the team. He was listed on the travel roster. He made the trip out to Notre Dame. Uh, but I don't know why they didn't show him. I'm, I don't make the, the – to be honest, I, I don't think they really – I mean, they, they tried to minimize their shots of the pit bench. I, I mean, like NBC – is very much a Notre Dame broadcast. It's, you know, very clear the way they talk and, uh, you know, the, the things they say, it's very clear that it's a Notre Dame centric broadcast and it's fine. It's the way it's been, you know, feels like all my life and certainly all my adult life and probably yours too, David. Uh, so we're, we're not going to get a lot of shots of, uh, Phil Dracovic, um, during the, uh, during the, the NBC broadcast, but, Look, I mean, I, I think you, you chalk that one up to a, a failed experiment. You know, they uh, somebody in the South Side thought that Phil Dracovic could be their answer for one year. Somebody in the South Side was wrong. And that's kind of the end of the story. Um, let's see here. I'll just, I'm going to read through a bunch of these. RJC man 38 says fundamentals not being taught. Narduzzi failed his kids by not handing Nate the ball to start the second half. Maybe, um, I don't even know if it would, I mean, I, maybe it would have mattered at that point. I, I don't know. I guess it's only a 17 to nothing game. Uh, you know, and in the second half, let's see what pit, what were pitch drives in the second half punt interception, interception. Yeah. That kind of sealed the deal. Um, that pretty much put it away. I, I still, so, I mean, it's, it's weird with Bayer. Like, I don't, you can't sit down after a game where a guy, uh, you know, throws what 14 of 29 for 127 and four interceptions. You can't sit down and say that you, you can't sit down and defend him. And you certainly are not going to defend that performance. I still like how he throws the ball. I still like how he runs around. I still like that sort of gunslinger mentality. Maybe this is not a team that's built to have a gunslinger at quarterback. Um, I haven't given up on Christian Bayer yet. I, I know probably a lot of people have, and understandably, he threw four interceptions. He completed less than 50% of his passes. Uh, he threw for like 127 yards. So I understand it. I, I'm not fully on board with giving up on him just yet, but there is a part of me that's really, really curious about Nate Arnell. There is a part of me that's really, really curious how well um, he can play or how well he might be able to lead this offense. There is a part of me that's really curious about what it looks like with him running the show. You know? I mean, we've seen him in such limited opportunities that it's it's hard to really say what he can do. I don't know what Nate Arnell can do. I don't know how he, you know, I don't know how what the offense would look like with him at quarterback for an entire game. We've only seen it once, and that was in a unique situation, uh, an emergency situation on the road against a, you know, a Mac team or whatever they are. So I, I can't deny that I'm very curious, uh, but I also, I, I'm not, I'm not entirely giving up on Christian Bayer either though. I mean, I think he's shown enough good things and signs of promise that like you want to ride it out a little bit and see what he can do. Um, you know, as he keeps playing and 
you know, hopefully get building confidence and getting a better feel for the offense. Uh, is there another super chatter that came in? There wasn't. Uh, let's see. <laughs> Swim Boyd says new goal of the season is to get halfway to bowl eligibility. Yeah, I mean, Syracuse looks bad. Boston College held on to beat UConn, and I think their quarterback got hurt a little bit during the game. Or no, I guess there was something weird with Boston College's quarterback. He came out at halftime, and Jeff Halfley was like, he, he doesn't feel good or something like that, which on the broadcast, they weren't really sure what that means. So um, I don't know what's going on there, but Pitt doesn't play Boston College for a while, so I, I don't think that'll really be an issue. There should be a couple more opportunities for wins. I, I, Pitt's, I don't think Pitt's as bad as they looked today um not saying that you know on if you gave them 50 games against notre dame they win 25 of them uh but i think they're they're not they wouldn't get blown out by 50 points every time they play notre dame if they if they play notre dame another 10 times i don't think they would lose by 50 and maybe any of them um so they're not as bad as they look today it's uh but it's hard to say that in the end. It's hard to say that when we're just less than an hour removed from a 50 point blowout loss. Um, let's see. Brock H2P says, I thought the game against Notre Dame in 2020 was bad. Yeah, this feels worse. This was worse than that. Mark Clementi says, The worst loss since the Ohio State debacle during the Majors 2 era. How does Narduzzi to survive this season? He needs to be replaced by a young offensive minded coach. I don't care about his extension. Buy him out. Well, young offensive minded. I, 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 I mean, I'm, I was going to look up like Paul Christ and see how old he was when he took the pit job. But I mean, that's not fair. And that's not what you mean. I mean, he's not going anywhere. He's not going to get fired. Even if they go 2 and 10, he's not going to get fired. That's not going to be the end. Uh, Oh, they just announced Florida State game is going to be a 3.30 game. So, never noon. 3.30. Um, Narduzzi's not going anywhere. I mean, he's, he's going to be back for next year. It's a question now of how hot the seat gets heading into next season. Uh, there's still a chance for them to show improvement over the course of the next four games. And that's what they're going to need to do. NJ Doc says, at one point I thought the Notre Dame coach was a good guy, but after his post-game interview when he commented about uh, touchdowns, he's a POS. Well, I didn't see what he said after the game about touchdowns, but I'll, I'll tell you this, he's not very smart. I shouldn't say he's not very smart. I, I think the the his decision at the end of the first half when he ran the clock down to 12 seconds and then took a timeout, kind of a boneheaded play, didn't make a lot of sense to me. I thought So I was curious about this. Notre Dame ran that play with 12 seconds left. Got called for offensive pass interference um, with nine seconds left. Would that not be a, a 10 second runoff? Is it just a procedure penalty where you get a 10 second runoff on an offensive penalty near the end of a half? I thought it would have been a 10 second runoff and, you know, then could have saved three points uh, a field goal. But it didn't make any sense for them to, to run the clock down, use their last time out to stop the clock at 12. Just line up and run a play. Um, because when you run the clock down to 12 seconds and you lose your la use your last time out to stop the clock at 12 seconds and it's third down, you've pretty much guaranteed that you're passing. Like running is not an option. I think it was third down at that point. Running is not an option because you can't run the ball and then stop the clock and kick a field goal. You have to throw the ball. And so I didn't get that. Uh, I didn't understand it. Uh, I thought that was a pretty boneheaded decision. I don't really know what he thought he was trying to accomplish there. He didn't want to give the ball back to Pitt. Because Pitt had like 113 yards of offense at that point. You were worried that Pitt would get the ball back with 30 or 40 seconds with one timeout when you've held them to like 100 yards of offense. Didn't really understand that. But yeah, I didn't see his postgame comments. Don't know what he said. Don't care. Uh, Angry Dolphin 71 says, This team is insanely bad. Heather needs to look deeply into firing Narduzzi. Year 9 and we are losing by 50. So that's what I mean though. You can't, like I don't think you can look at it and say year 9 and we're losing by 50. I know you'd like to think that, like, by year nine, you're, you're past having a game like this. I mean, this is the worst loss in the Narduzzi era, right? I mean, like, points-wise. still think the Georgia Tech loss last year might have been the worst 
actual loss of the Narduzzi era. Um, but points wise, this was the lo worst loss of the Narduzzi era. But I mean, you're in that cycle down, right? You're in that year where you're going to cycle down, which was inevitable. And then it's compounded by the injuries and then some bad fluky luck. You know, you end up two and six for a team that could be four and four. Um, it's this was a bad game this is a bad season but the entirety of the narduzzi era still is more good than bad and and the program is still in a better spot than it was nine years ago and i, I don't think that's really up for debate and so if he's improved the program he's reached a level of success i mean it, it you know he did reach a level of success that the program had not seen in 40 years and yes, two years later, he's having one of the worst seasons in 20 years. 40-year high, 20-year low. Which one wh Which one counts more for you? <laughs> it's a bad game. I, I can't sit here and defend the Narduzzi era after a 51-point loss. I mean, I, I can't. I mean, I will. I mean, we'll just keep doing shots and, uh, you know, I'll, I'll tell you why he's the best coach in pit history or something like that. But the reality is... It's a 58 to seven loss and, and there's not a lot you can defend in the aftermath of that. So I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to try. Let's see. Um, you know, super chatter here. Who's jumping in. Michael B is jumping in late. Uh, Chris Narduzzi is gone. If 2024 is another season of two or three wins, right? No way he can be bought, brought back in 2025. If that's the case, am I wrong? I, if Panarduzzi loses, or if Panarduzzi goes two and ten, if Panarduzzi goes two and ten next year, then yeah, we can have that conversation. You know, I, I think we can we can talk about whether he should be back or not be back, and he probably won't be back and all that. I don't think he's going to. Right, just like two thousand twenty one wasn't the start of some five-year run of 11 win seasons i don't necessarily think 2023 is going to be the start of a five-year run of two win seasons okay i like look at the roster like like let's look at the personnel okay look at the the, the guys who let's assume everyone comes back next year okay and we, we can't assume that there are going to be guys that go to the transfer portal but let's assume everybody comes back next year rodney hammond if they give him the ball is a good college football college running back he is he's good he's good he actually i don't know if you know this uh, i don't know if you guys realized this or noticed it he carried the ball six times for 31 yards now why did he only get the ball six times i don't know but when he got the ball he gained 31 yards he averaged more than five yards per carry on his six carries he's a good college football player Kanate Mumfield is a good college football player. Bob Means is actually a good college football player. Gavin Bartholomew is a good college football player. Kenny Johnson is a good college football player. They have good skill players on this team. They do. The offensive line by next year, I think will be better than it is this year. It won't be so mismatched like that. I, I think they'll have, you know, if they can keep five guys healthy for most of the season, they'll be in pretty good shape. Okay. Defense. I, I think the safeties will be really good next year. I, I think Javon McIntyre is a good player. I think Donovan McMillan's a good player. I think PJ O'Brien has two interceptions in the last two games. I think he's a good player. I think that, uh, you know, Stephon Hall got some playing time late in this game. I think they'll have a really good two deep of safeties next year. I think the linebackers next year should be pretty solid. I, I think Bengali Kamara will come back, uh, you know, as opposed to going to the NFL after the season he's had this year, limited as it was by injury. I think Solomon Shields is a really good player. I think Brandon George can be a good middle linebacker. I think they can find different options there as well. Jordan Bass, Braylon Lovelace, Rasheem Biles, and Kyle Lewis are all getting Huge, valuable reps this season as young players, true freshmen and redshirt freshmen. And so I think you'll have a really good two deep of linebackers. You're going to have to figure some stuff out at corner. I, I'll tell you that. Like, I, if it was me in the fourth quarter tonight, I would have had Ryland Gandy, Noah Bigelow, Tamarian Crumpley out there the whole time. The whole time. By the time we got to the fourth quarter, MJ Devonshire, Mark Wes Williams, AJ Woods, you guys aren't playing. Don't need you anymore. Don't need to see you. Don't need to have you out there. 
you did fine in this game. Nothing I could really say good or bad. Just don't need you anymore. We're going to get the young guy snaps. Remember I said at the beginning, they were playing their backups during a blowout because they were in a blowout loss. Get the young corners some playing time. You're going to have to count on at least one of them. Even if you plan to go to the portal for a corner, which they probably will, I don't think you're going to get two starters out of the portal. So you're going to have to count on somebody from that group. You might as well get them on the field. So we'll see there. And obviously they need development among the, along the defensive line. My point here is that I think there's enough talent on this team to win eight games. I, I really do. I think there's enough talent on this team to win eight games this year. If they didn't, if they could have made better decisions about the quarterback position, I think they win eight games. Seven, maybe. I think they definitely get to a bowl. All right, let's let's say that. You want me to start, uh, start start slow and work up. I think they definitely get to a bowl. Um, if they make better decisions at quarterback, because I think the team is talented enough, and because I think the team is talented enough, I don't think this is starting some run of two win seasons. Again, like I said. 2021 was never going to start some run of 11 win seasons and 2023 is not going to start some run of two, three, four win seasons. It's, it's not, I I'm fairly confident about that. Now, if they go out, if, if they finish this year and they're only two and 10 or three and nine and they go out next year and they're two and 10 or three and nine, then yeah, we're gonna have a conversation. Seat's going to be hot, hot enough to probably make a change, but I don't think that's going to happen. see what else we got <clears throat> scott traverso says he reached that level of success and hated how it was accomplished so yeah so there's this this running thought right the pat Arduzzi, uh looked at all the success they had in 2021 and said i don't want to do that again I get where that comes from, right? I get that he wanted to run the ball more, which for all the claims about wanting to run the ball more, you know, they came into today with the fewest team rushing attempts out of any team in the ACC. You know that, right? For for their insistence on running the ball, how it's a stone age offense that just runs the ball. They run the ball less than anybody in the conference. And probably, they're probably dead last now. They were tied with Florida State for last in the conference in uh you know um rushing attempts now this year or, or after today where they had 19 rushing attempts they probably they're probably dead last by themselves i would guess probably below florida state i'm assuming florida state ran the ball more than 19 times because they blew out wake forest which is what you should do when you play wake forest because wake forest is not good um Here's the idea. Here is what Pat Narduzzi was thinking coming out of 2021. All right. And he has said some of these things, some of these things I've sort of gleaned from conversations with him, conversations with other people around the program, and just looking at it. He wanted more balance in the sense of not being uh, pass, 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 pass. Okay. He didn't want to stop throwing. He just wanted to be able to run a little more. Because he felt like they were pretty good at running when they did it in 2021. They just didn't do it very often. And maybe being able to run a little bit more or maybe running a little bit more or choosing to run a little more, maybe that would have given him a better chance against Western Michigan or something, right? But he also knew going into 2022 that he wasn't going to have Kenny Pickett. And so getting an offense that could be more balanced when you don't, I mean, is, is not a bad idea when you're not going to have a Heisman finalist at quarterback, right? I don't think the goal of getting a more balanced offense was a bad one. I, I think that was fairly admirable. And I understand where he was coming from. Being able to attack on the ground and in the air makes sense. Um, things got messed up in the execution of that plan, though. Um, it didn't. I don't think it went the way it needed to go or according to plan 
So I don't think he looked at it and said, boy, we just won the ACC. We won 11 games by throwing the ball all the time. I want to stop doing that. I think he wanted a, a more balanced offense, which I don't think is the worst idea. You know I mean? I think they had talented players who could make a running game go. Um, it's just a question of whether he made the best decision on how to go about achieving that more balanced offense. Um, let's see if there's any other. Scrolling through the comments here. Might be through all the super chatter, so I'll get a few more comments. Uh, you know, we're already over our hour, uh, our hour allotment, but, um, Benjamin Glazer says, I didn't get to watch the game at all. I feel like I'm the only winner. Homer Simpson says, Narduzzi did his job. He brought stability and a culture to pit. He reached his peak with winning the ACC championship. Now we need to bring in an offensive first head coach. Defense doesn't win championships anymore. So here's, here's the thing. And maybe we'll leave it at this. All right. There's a lot of tweeting from pit players right now. There's a lot of tweeting from pit players right now. I mean, we'll just say that. I'll, I'll say this. So there's a quote, Noah Hiles tweeted this out from Pat Narduzzi. He said, quote, we lost a lot of good players last year. We thought we'd, re we'd replace them, and we obviously didn't do a good job with that. And Pitt's players are responding to that. Pitt's players are quote tweeting that. Pitt's players are saying a lot of things. Rodney Hammond says, question mark, crazy world. As a quote tweet of that quote, again, the Narduzzi quote, we lost a lot of good players last year. We thought we'd replace them, and we obviously didn't do a good job with that. So Rodney Hammond quote tweets that. I I, I don't mean to sit here and, and report on what is being tweeted. And maybe it's the uh, hidden stills, whiskey talking, but this feels significant. So the Narduzzi quote, quote, we lost a lot of good players last year. We thought we'd replace them and we obviously didn't do a good job with that. End quote. Rodney Hammond, quote, tweet, question mark, crazy world. Montrevious Lloyd doing one of those hmm emojis. MJ Devonshire, a frowning emoji. Marquez Williams, wow, that just hurt my heart seeing this. Uh, let's see if any other pit players. I mean, Wendell Davis, the former pit player, linebacker transferred to Northwestern, says, You have great players, you just didn't do a good job replacing Whipple. Listen, man, you. <laughs> not sure that's the best comment to make I'm not sure that's the best thing to say i'm not sure that's the best way to approach this situation right now and uh, i see a few of you guys are talking about that comment in the uh chat here and um understandably you probably shouldn't make wholesale criticisms of your roster Well, Joe Baker, actually, Joe Baker is in the comments. He says, uh, remember when Jeff Capel threw the team under the bus after the ACC tournament a few years ago? Maybe football would get a Blake Henson as well. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, Michael B is a uh, chimes in one last time as a super chatter and says, uh, Chris, it's obvious Pat Narduzzi left, lost the team after his comments. Um, yeah, I mean, Capel said we have to get better players, right? Two years ago, and then he went out and got better players and made the NCAA tournament. So maybe uh, Pat Narduzzi has the same thing in mind. He's going to have to address those comments with the team because you can't say that. You, you, you can't say that. 
It has to be all about coaches. Publicly, it has to be all about coaches. Publicly, you have to say, we messed up. I messed up. We're not doing the best job. We're not making the best decisions. We're not making the best personnel decisions. We're not making the best coaching decisions. We're not making the best game plan decisions. We're not making the best anything decisions. And if the players don't execute, that's on us too. You don't, you can't, you can't make a comment like that. You, you need to address that with the team like ASAP. You know, Noah, Noah Hiles tweeted that quote, um, just reading Noah's tweet. He tweeted that about 55 minutes ago. So that quote has been floating around in the ether for close to an hour. Actually, no, it was less than 55 minutes ago. Um, you, you know, that. so that quote came out almost an hour ago. Um, you, you need to address that with the team. Like on the flight. On the flight back to Pittsburgh. I don't know what to make of that. That's a... You got to think about who your audience is. And realize that some of the things you're going to say are going to get back to the people you're saying them about. And would you walk into a team meeting and say, Guys, I'm sorry. We lost good players last year and we thought you would be good enough to replace them, but... My bad. We, uh, and I apologize for the long pauses here because I'm, I'm trying to be rather measured with my words after a couple shots and a couple beers, but, um, a lot of times we admire and appreciate Pat Narduzzi for his, uh, shoot from the hip, speak his mind, tell you what he's thinking, candor. Um, I'm not sure this is one of those times. And there are a lot of times where it comes back to bite you. I, I'm getting notifications because Ryan Bear is retweeting all of his teammates' re reactions to it. I, I mean, it's, it, imagine being on that flight right now. And you're looking around and you're saying, you know, Coach Jews just said, they replaced a lot of good players, but didn't replace them with good enough players. He, he's saying we're not good enough to 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 replace the guys who left here. He's gonna have to make that right. He has to make. I mean, like I guess in the aftermath of a fifty-eight to seven loss, you're searching for answers. Right. I just like we have for the last, how long have we been on, the, been on the air here? This is our longest one ever. This is like, a, you know, an hour and 12 minutes, hour and 13 minutes, something like that. We, um, we've been out on the hour on the air for almost like approaching 75 minutes. And, and the whole time we've been searching for what to say about a 58 to seven loss. The whole time we've been searching about what to say after a game where you lost by more than 50 points, where you were outclassed and pretty much run off the field, where you lost the game in all three phases, where your offense wasn't good enough, your defense wasn't good enough, and your special teams wasn't good enough. And we're all sitting here trying to figure out what to say in the midst of a two and six season. And, and it's not easy. It's not easy to find those things to talk about. I remember I threw my notepad over there. I just, boo. So I don't even need this. Because who cares about those little plays, this play or that play? What they did on this third down, what they did on that third down. I keep getting notifications about, because uh, I still have the pit players tweets. And it's still going on. More players are responding. So I keep getting notifications about it. Um, as they respond to that quote, but we all sat here and tried to figure out what do you say after a game like that? You know, you're struggling to come up with answers. You're struggling to come up with words to describe or define what a game like that, 
is like. Um, and, and I guess Pat Narduzzi's in the same spot. I guess he's struggling to find answers. He's struggling to find explanations. But you can't turn on the players like that. You, I mean, you can't. You cannot. You turn on the coaches. You put it on the coaches. You, you, know, you blame it on the coaches. I'm a man. I'm 40, right? I mean, it's, it's the Mike Gundy thing. And if you're a coach, no matter how much, when you go into the film room, you're going to rip this guy and you're going to rip that guy and you're going to rip this guy and you're going to rip that guy. And that's fine. You do that. And those kids know they're in for it. The players know they're in for it. But not in the post-game press conference. You don't walk into the post-game press conference. You can't walk into the post-game press conference and say, our players just aren't good enough. And it was... It was misguided when Jeff Capel said it. You're right. I, I forgot that Jeff Capel said that. It was misguided when Jeff Capel said it two years ago. And it's misguided now. And I know you're angry. I know you're frustrated. I know you're you're discouraged and disappointed with what's going on. And even if you're right, even if you didn't replace them with good enough players. Can't say that. Because who brought those players? Who made the decision to play those guys? I mean, you want to say, well, you know. I mean, take any take any pick. Take your pick. <laughs> they just keep coming. The, the, the tweet responses just keep coming. Take your pick at any of the personnel decisions they made to replace the guys that they lost. And who made those decisions? Who brought those players here? Right or wrong, you can't say that publicly. I don't know what to say. I feel like we should stay online. I, I feel like we should stay. Uh, um, I, I feel like we should stay uh, stay live and just keep reacting to pit players and their responses because it's. A lot of them are having some things to say. Broken heart emojis and things like that. It's tough. It's real tough. All right. Um, <laughs> Michael B wants me to stay alive. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I don't know what else there is to say at this point. I guess we just watch the aftermath and watch the, watch the car crash that this night has become. Um, just in you know you you would think that a 58 to 7 loss was bad enough it would be enough of a car crash as it is but um it looks like we'll have uh, some things to watch over the course of the night you can't uh, you just you just can't and, and look i'm out of beers my beers are empty more beers are way over there. So I'm not going to stay live and walk all the way across the room and get another beer and, and all that. And, uh, yeah. uh, and, uh, you know, waste your time any more than we have. But look, I appreciate that we could all get together like this and hang out and talk for a little while. I don't know how much of a post game show this was. I feel like it was just more of a venting session for you, for me, for pits players on Twitter, but you know, that's what we're here to do. Hey, I haven't even asked you like, and subscribe. You might not have liked the outcome of the game, but hopefully you like this post-game show. So like the video and subscribe to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash pantherlair.com, um, panther-lair.com, pittsburgh.rivals.com. Uh, well, I just switched I just switched gears completely there. I was talking about the YouTube channel and I ended up talking about the website. Listen, uh, it's because I got distracted looking at something else. Um this is the problem. You got to stay focused when you're doing these live shows. But look, uh, like this video and subscribe. YouTube.com slash PantheLair.com. It's the uh, best way to stay up on all of our pit video content. Morning pit videos Monday through Friday. Uh, the uh, you know weekly live show that we do every Wednesday night at 8.30 p.m. On these live post-game shows that we do right now, which sometimes seem to take an interesting twist uh, as, as they uh, occasionally do. Uh, you don't want to miss any of it. So subscribe, youtube.com slash Turn on your notifications so that we uh, uh, 
so you never miss any of the things, any of our videos that we post or any of our live shows that we uh, we do here at youtube.com slash pantheralaircom. And then check out the website. We're going to have a lot of content there. Jim Hammond is out in South Bend covering the Pitt game, the Pitt-Notre Dame game. He'll have a lot of post-game coverage. We'll have uh, lots of content throughout the weekend and heading into the start of the new week. Plus Pitt basketball, right? Wednesday night, exhibition game. We can all drown our sorrows in Pitt hoops. Um, thanks so much for tuning in tonight. Really appreciate it. See if anybody else jumped in uh, here at the end. But I appreciate everybody with the uh, comments and questions. I appreciate all the uh, super chatters. Uh, you guys are awesome. It's been a lot of fun uh, having this little conversation. Listen, enjoy the rest of your night. Watch a little football and try to uh, take your mind off it. Appreciate you guys tuning in, though, as always. So Pitt loses, but we all get to hang out. So I guess we're all winners, right? All right. <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> Have a good, uh, <coughs> excuse me, have a good rest of the weekend. And uh, we will catch up with you Monday morning for the morning pit on uh, youtube.com slash